uh, Newton, for example, believed that the uh, world is constructed like a clock, and therefore uh, he compared for to a clockmaker where everything works uh, precisely. So, a kind of mechanical or mechanistic interpretation of God uh, came to existence. Uh, thus, you may say that the 18th century, with the rise of the philosophers, philosophers. Uh, the French thinkers uh, who contributed to the encyclopedic movement, uh, they were called philosophers. So uh, they believed that, like all other subjects, even God can be you know, uh, understood and classified uh, as a kind of knowledge. But basically, the uh, more philosophy was making progress, or we may rather correctly say that more science was making progress in the 18th century with the environment, uh, more faith was receding. And uh, when Matthew writes in Global Beach that the oceans of faith are receding, uh, he was actually lamenting the you know, passing away of uh, faith in God because with enlightenment, with uh, modern philosophy, with the development of science, more and more people lost their faith. So? Yes. Uh, how far was the Baconian empiricism responsible for fathering such uh, notions? Which, which empiricism? Baconian principle of yes. Um, well, uh, Bacon is considered as the you know, uh, principal uh, you know, man who uh, encouraged scientific experimentation. And uh, therefore, his motto is advancement of knowledge and uh, scientific experimentations in the laboratory uh, and, and coming, arriving at certain knowledge uh, by means of uh, laboratory experimentations uh, which can be repeated uh, rather than uh, by means of logic or uh, you know, kind of the way uh, theological uh, Theologians would use logic. They uh, can oppose that. So he was rather in favor of using logic in an inductive fashion and not in the uh, deductive way uh, that uh, conventionally Aristotelian logic was used. So uh, he, we must say, uh, advanced. Uh, science and the principles of science and perhaps indirectly was responsible, I do not know, about the lack of faith. Because uh, in Bacon's time, people had faith. So they all still believed in faith, they believed in God. Uh, and therefore Bacon himself also definitely believed in God. And uh, I, as I told you that uh, up to Descartes, we find a conviction among philosophers that God can be proved with the help of reason. So, on the one hand, there was a crisis uh, between uh, faith and reason, that is, the application of reason appeared to denote faith. On the other hand, uh, the belief that God can be rationalized as a maker of this universe, as a creator, uh, that belief persisted for many, many years. Up to Newton, it was quite strong. And therefore, uh, we cannot say that Newton uh, was in any way responsible for the erosion of faith. We can say that he is responsible for the development of scientific principles and scientific investigations. However, uh, in the 18th century, with 
realize of the flow of uh, this. The other skeptical tendency, uh, which we know that it, it ran down all the way from classical Greek philosophy, of course, but in the Renaissance, skepticism was a very strong uh, point of view, and Montaigne was the greatest exemplar of skepticism. Uh, Marcus Aurelius and others among the Romans. So, uh, Hero, another skeptic, Hironian skepticism. So, Moten uh, writes uh, expansively on uh, these ideas so the idea of skepticism, the idea of God, whether uh, one can still believe in God or not by applying rational principles. Uh, in his famous essay, Apology for Remosebo. And by the time we arrive at, uh, you know, late 18th century, by that time, skepticism, empiricism, agnosticism, uh, these uh, were becoming stronger and stronger uh, because of the uh, development of science, uh, I suppose. Mm. And therefore, uh, in the 19th century, when Walsh was writing his poetry, then uh, it was possible to disbelieve all systems of theology, systematic belief of the law. Uh, what's the word? Uh, we do not believe in systematic uh, theological explanation of God. Therefore, uh, intuition. I will write slowly and my handwriting will be bad because I am writing with my mouse. Intuition uh, was a major uh, you know, source of uh, believing anything which cannot be scientifically uh, explained. And therefore, uh, all sorts believe that there is a presence in everything in this world and also in the mind of man. Uh, in this belief, we find two things. Uh, well, we may say that first, we may say that what was thought is non-systematic. non-systematic thought and he believed in some kind of in intuitive understanding, non-systematic. And secondly, uh, he believes uh, in presence, so he uh, does not all God, God, but replaces it with presence. Which word, of course, always had a metaphysical connotation, and uh, finding a euphemistic expression for God. Uh, can be seen among uh, 19th century uh, philosophers. Uh, so, Hegel, for example, called God World Spirit. Because as a philosopher, he could not uh, he could not speak about God uh, because God cannot be philosophically you know, supported. Uh, God, the concept of God was a metaphysical or a, a theological you know, idea, it was the concept of faith rather than reason. So he could not speak of God, he 
the lower part of our sphere, uh, which we said uh, finds manifestation in this world uh, according to uh, the uh, exigency of time. Therefore, every time or every period in history has a spirit on its own, uh, which we or German word, sight, touch. Now, if you do English also, sight means time, dice means spirit. So, uh, its literal translation will be spirit of the time. And the spirit of the time in every age tries to find reflection in its philosophy, in the works of art produced in this period and so on, in literature and so on. Uh, so what we see here is that also believe that this present presence is omnipresent. That is, it is present in everything. Now, this is not a new thought, uh, because traditionally, uh, sorry, traditionally people believe that God was omnipresent. Only Watson is not using the word God, but using the word presence. Uh, that is his belief here we find. Secondly, we find that he believes that uh, all creation is interfused. That is, uh, nothing in this world is separated or alienated from another thing. So everything is interfused or joined together. Uh, because of this spirit uh, which is common in everything. Objects, all thinking things, all objects of all power. So the, the if this is the first thing that we know, is the second thing that we know is where we, this concept of presence, and the third thing that we know is is that uh, all thinking things as well as All objects of all power. So whether anything is subject, that is thinking thing, only man is a thinking thing, or object, they are all same. They are all pervaded by the spirit. Therefore, in a way this uh, negates the subject-object duality believed in by uh, Descartes, just a second. So when he says, uh, all thinking things, all objects of all thought and roads to all things. So, Thinking things means they are subject, objects of all thought, they are objects, but subjects, objects, everything, through everything the spirit uh, 
knows through his presence, knows through everything. And therefore everything becomes interview, joint. And uh, this uh, abolishes all difference. So there is no difference between subject and object. So, yes. uh, in that sense, it, it's very much the part of the trajectory uh, of uh, the Renaissance shift of the spirit from God to man, and then an acceptance that everything, uh, all creatures, uh, contain the divine presence uh, within them, interfused on its account. Are you, do you have in mind any particular thinker or any particular tradition? No, sir. Only a general tra uh, trajectory. You see, uh, if you talk about Renaissance thought, then you may refer to Renaissance Platonism, or Renaissance Experimentalism, or Renaissance Skepticism. So, in which tradition of thought do you think that uh, it, it is like this? Uh, no, sir, not like this. Uh, I mean, uh, the zeitgeist, zeitgeist of the Renaissance uh, age was the shift from spirit, uh, shift of spirit from God to man. Okay, so you are referring to the Renaissance philosophy of man? Humanism. Yes, basically uh, the philosophy of man. Uh, but you have to understand that uh, whether you talk about Renaissance humanism or you talk about the uh, Renaissance uh, philosophy of man, uh, the shift from uh, God to man, no, there is no such shift. Uh, what you mean to say is that uh, man was placed at the center of the shift world. From, shift of the focus from God to man. No. Uh, no. That did not happen in the Renaissance. Uh, but uh, man was placed at the center uh, of the world uh, in the thought, for example, of uh, Renaissance Platonist Kodala Mirandola, uh, who talks about the great chain of being. And uh, in that chain of being, which is a Platonic or Neoplatonic idea, uh, God is at the top, then angels, then spirits, uh, man, and uh, man is in the middle, and animals, plants, and inanimate objects, and so on. So, uh, Pico said that well, man is at the middle of this chain, but man is also free to move radically up and down, and so on. So, considering uh, the freedom of man, which uh, other beings do not have, even angels do not have, people thought that man was much more significant. So uh, this uh, is not actually a shift from, you know, the shift of the focus from God to man. You have to understand that the, the ideas which developed in the 18th century uh, with the enlightened mind, we cannot imagine that the Renaissance thinkers had a similar idea. That, that was not there. But of course, a man was emphasized a lot in the Renaissance. But um, you know, God was always important for that reason. Right? So whether it is the Platonist Teton, tradition or the Aristotelian tradition, for example, uh, the tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas, which was followed up by the Aristotelian Renaissance in Mainz, uh, they believed in God according to uh, the uh, philosophy of Aquinas and uh, the application of Aristotle's logic uh, made them uh, think that, uh, like Aquinas' application of logic, God can be logical. Therefore, God was never, you know, focus was never shifted from God away. But, of course, focus was on man. Uh, in the sense that it was never there before. That you can say that uh, in the Renaissance, 
to focus all upon man in such a way which it was never there before. And uh, in that there is not deeper from the Middle Ages or the classical practice. But we cannot say that the focus was shifted from God to man. But that, that actually happened in the uh, 18th century with the Enlightenment. And in the 19th century, uh, what else happened? I mean, uh, gradually the uh, when uh, waning of the theological uh, concept of God, or waning of faith, uh, that was uh, waning of faith uh, was being felt more and more. in the late 18th century and I think uh, Nietzsche died in 1900 if I am not wrong. So uh, Nietzsche was a major influence on early 20th century thought. Uh, of course Nietzsche was later than Wordsworth but I am just saying that uh, the uh, inclination of philosophy and the inclination of uh, you know, thought was to move away from faith to agnosticism and skepticism. But in order to uh, understand what's what, we have to refer to the 18th century thing. So Nietzsche had famously said that God is dead. What is dead? In last uh, four years. So this wedding of faith finds expression also in Matthew Arnold's poetry. But in Orson's poetry, we do not find uh, any lament that, you know, that faith is receding like the way we found in Matthew Arnold's Jogodrips. But here we see that there is a kind of an optimism, a positive attitude uh, that, well, presence is everywhere in this world and the world uh, is joined together as if uh, it is an organic whole. Sir, could this be could this be termed as egoistical sublime? That is, I think, the idea of art. Keats. Keats, uh, yes, but originally, to have been. The idea of sublime. Slunginess. You know, uh, in this poem we are not talking about uh, exactly the sublime. The sublime uh, which we find in Congeners, which we find later also uh, developed in Kant's uh, philosophy uh, and in other leaders also. Uh, that does not, uh, we do not find an impression of that here in this poem. But here, to find something more, uh, I should say, uh, mystical. There is an element of mysticism uh, in this form of worship. About one presence in everything with two answers. It is not the sublime. The sublime is feeling of something great, something awe-inspiring, either in nature or in art. That is <clears throat> Therefore, I am still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear. Also says that I am still a lover of the meadows and the woods. 
why still because earlier in my youth i uh, madly loved nature i enjoyed nature and even now i am still a lover of the meadows and the woods so in words of poetry nature is a benign presence or a benign influence the words of the not need to speak about god because uh, he uh, seems to have met a religion of nature nature takes the place of god for him nature has a benign presence and a benign uh, influence on man according to his theory. so two things here therefore uh, which uh, make us makes us think that there is a logical connection uh, in what the poet said earlier and what he is saying now so therefore uh, all this stands for some logical relationship so what is the logic here that what was using therefore Uh, the logic is that since there is a presence in everything in this world therefore i still love nature so everything in this world uh or words were become synonymous with nature and therefore there is no need to speak of god So, like the term "God," which uh, meant for people earlier the explanation of everything and all inclusive uh, on the other concept, for us, for nature becomes that all inclusive on the other concept. uses therefore because there is presence in everything that is why i still i have faith in nature i am a lover so what so do not say faith because faith is a term associated with religion what so is not found in a new religion so he does not use the word faith but he says he is a lover we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear now that is another uh, very words for the formulation perceived by men through their senses visual auditory and so on therefore underneath this phrase we can see lock theory of sensation also kantian philosophy yes yes then yes you may be right explain Then Kant said that uh, we all see the world differently, and uh, depends on our perceptions. It's uh, we. Uh, yes. 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 Yes.
he emphasized on uh, the importance of uh, perceptions and denied any objective uh, truth or any objective uh, state of being Actually, the philosophy which uh, believes that there is no other presence, no a priori presence of the world. Like Kant believes that there is an a priori uh, presence of the world. Uh, the philosophy which says that there is no a priori presence of the world, the world comes to existence only when we perceive it through our consciousness. That is the philosophy which we call phenomenology, that is the philosophy of Husserl. But uh, we did not mention it here. It is not applicable to Husserl's philosophy. I just told you because you were raising this issue. Uh, so, for Wordsworth, we have to understand him uh, according to the philosophy or the thought which was available to him. Okay. Uh, so, like we cannot at random think that, you know, everything from the Renaissance uh, to the uh, modern times, all kinds of thought can be read in Wordsworth. No. So we have to read Wordsworth in this context, in the intellectual context. So what was immediately available to him was uh, Enlightenment philosophy and uh, philosophy of Kant and uh, his talk. Uh, Therefore, Warsaw was reacting uh, to the uh, scientific you know, kind of dominance of scientific positivism. Which makes you know, another faith out of scientific reason. Uh, so that is wrong. Uh, that is uh, known as politics. That is the wrong kind of problem. Also, it is reacting to it is reacting to making science uh, kind of faith. And therefore, uh, he uh, would uh, imagine that uh, there is a presence of something. The entire universe, uh, which makes the universe stand as one. Therefore, of course, uh, there is this idea of spirit uh, in Wordsworth. But since he is not formulating any philosophy or theology, therefore he avoids terms like spirit uh, but uses the term. So 
he wants to keep his uh, you know thought unformulated or unsystematic you know, uh, he is against a systematic philosophical or religious you know uh, teaching of dogma against dogma against system uh, what was he upholding intuition imagination even locke had theorized about intuition as uh, one kind of judgment uh, so intuition imagination uh, these were or words were more important and very much important was sensation that is also derived from rock and later you see that uh, for kids later romantic a uh, particular kids uh, perception of nature through sensation is very important and kids use as many imagery where we see the visual sensation oral sensation uh, these are of great importance in the writing you know, a lot for example uh, the sensation of hearing the music of the nighting pervades uh, this world that was the kids were drawing so kids were of course influenced by what were indirectly by uh, now also so all this i said to explain the phase the mighty world of i and here both what the half cave and what perceive were things recognized in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my pure thoughts the nas the guide the guardian of my heart and so all of my moral me now here comes another uh, formulation which needs explanation half cave and half perceive so the senses they perceive this world they perceive the stimuli of this world but they also create so what sort of imagines that senses can both create and perceive so he does not imagine the senses to be mechanical just as a machine may record sounds our auditory senses according to what's of uh they are not just recording machines so what they perceive is mixed with something that we create by imagination so whatever we perceive is not a mechanical recording of the you know stimuli in this world uh, that would be a very mechanical scientific you know uh, concept but for what's what imagination plays great to intuition to the great to and the senses also half create and half perceive uh, and then uh, they recognize then uh, well pleased to recognize the nature and the language of sense who is well pleased what sort what sort says that from the language of the sense i recognize in nature the anchor of my pure thoughts that is nature so as i perceive nature with the senses i come to recognize nature as the supreme 
now presents uh, in my life. And the false nature, the anchor of my purest thoughts. And which means that he imagines that his own whole existence is anchored uh, by his so nature, gives him stability, gives him direction, gives him guidance. So what are the other words that he uses in the nature? Nars. Which means that nature provides sustenance and guide. Which means that nature gives him direction. And guardian. Guardian of my heart. That is how I should feel, what I should feel, that is also dictated by this. And soul of all my moral being. So, nature is a great educator, guide, and also uh, teaches us morality. Therefore, uh, what's good? When he looks at nature, when he looks at the harmony of all things in nature, then he realizes that the ideal morality would be to be in harmony with everything else. And this is one word which also people do this. Alright, so I will stop here. Uh, if you have any questions or want me to explain anything more, you can ask me. So, we, we see that all these reflections in this poem that we find, uh, they are the results of looking at the river valley of me, and the ruin cathedral, though was never mentioned the cathedral. That is the most important thing in the Muni Valley, at least for tourists or historians. And he never mentioned the cathedral. So uh, he mentions nature. So uh, by looking at nature, he has this reflection uh, in this poem uh, where he expresses his idea how nature has a beneficial uh, influence on him uh, through memory. Uh, because Wordsworth uh, would uh, repeatedly talk about repeatedly talk about how he goes back uh, to river to the river we and uh, and when he looks at the river valley then he is inspired by the thought of how nature influences him in a benign way and then he projects into the future how nature will continue to work uh, on uh, his sister Dorothy uh, if Dorothy later revisits this river valley then she will remember how nature acted on her brother Wordsworth. Right. 
therefore uh, memory appears to be a significant idea in this poem uh, because nature acts through memory this garish artist sarvadar dali has a famous painting and persistence of memory in the surrealist poetry uh, it does not have any relation to wordsworth but wordsworth talks about the persistent role of memory uh, by which nature works on man so i was just reminded of dali's So, do you have any other question? Uh, sir? Huh? Yes. Huh? Yes. Uh, can we consider Wordsworth's uh, negation of the cathedral from the lands, his poetic landscape uh, as uh, deliberately suggestive? Negation of what? Negation of the cathedral. I mean, he doesn't use any theological loaded, theologically loaded terms in his lines either. So, in association with that. No, uh, the well, the thing is that uh, the cathedral is so ancient. I'm glad you asked this question because when I visited, I I really uh, looked at the cathedral, the ruins rather, the cathedral uh, in wonder. Uh, it is a major tourist. you know attraction uh it does not remind one of religion uh, because uh, more than you know a place where worship was practiced more than that the cathedral was a place where the monks used to live it was their residence the the monks lived in the quarters cathedral and uh, those quarters can still be seen uh, so the cathedral does not remind one of religion so much uh, as of you know the uh, ways of life in the middle ages or the monastic way of life and the fact that the uh, river valley is kind of a secluded place uh, where the cathedral stands so it also uh, to hoax the idea of seclusion uh, and that is what we find repeatedly in this poem uh, seclusion uh, the image of the hermit you no know, uh, so in that sense there is an evocation uh, of uh, loneliness the predominance of nature all around with no people uh, in there because nobody lives there now Uh, so uh, i suppose that the uh, cathedral resonates in the poem in a different way even though it does not resonate in, in the poem as uh, by the book in religion cheat and yes so hello yes so uh, uh so why in wordsworth's poetry the memory is an important thing why but i never asked this question myself So I have to, you know, what find here because uh, it is. I I always accepted uh, what was use of memory in this uh, philosophy. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. You want to say anything? Uh, let us see. Does he really act? Does he act again? Does he act again? Uh, 
the very important part of Watson's theory, uh, or Watson believes that uh, the that nature does not influence man only once. That is, when you visit uh, nature or when you uh, have an immediate sensation of nature, but these sensations uh, are stored in memory for future use. So, uh, I will look into this question. There must be some reference. Oh, sir? Yes. Uh, am, am I audible now? Yes, yes. yes. Such memory act as an associative element throughout the poem. I mean, it uh, links several temporal spaces together of yes. the past and the present. Yes, of course, it does. But the first question is why? Uh, does memory play such a, such a role in Watson's thought? Uh, so, uh, association of ideas, uh, heartless thoughts, heartless emotions, uh, association of ideas, which also acts through memory. Uh, that I explained earlier. Uh, but I suppose that it can be further investigated. Right? I, I have always accepted uh, that Watson used memory. But I never investigated why he used memory. So Tushar uh, uh, makes me think about it. So I will investigate it and uh, find out uh, which kind of philosophy, which kind of thought, other than art, of course. Uh, why memory uh, becomes important for us. Thank you, Tushar, for the question. Okay then. So uh, can I stop here?